Hi everyone, welcome back. In this, we're going to talk about conditioned and unconditioned reinforcement, and that will sort of help with the rest of this module, which is schedules and differential reinforcement. This is super important. It's almost like a basic concept, but I like adding it here because it will help you understand some of the later videos. This entire module is all, I call it teaching interventions. There are also consequence interventions because they come after the end of after behavior, but they're all your differential reinforcement interventions. So in this video, we're going to talk about unconditioned reinforcement and conditioned reinforcement. We'll talk about pairing neutral stimuli with reinforcers and then we'll distinguish between generalized and specific conditioned reinforcers, which will lead us into our token economy discussion. We'll also identify these concepts with real life scenarios. So what is reinforcement? It is a consequence that will increase the future likelihood of a behavior. People misuse the term negative reinforcement all the time. They use it for essentially a punishment. So they say that was negative reinforcing or that whatever you did when really you were attempting to punish the behavior or it was something that reduced the behavior in the future. Negative reinforcement increases behavior in the future. It's still reinforcement. That's the key word. I understand how negatives can be confusing. I feel like maybe we should come up with new names for these things so teachers and parents can better understand it. But there's two types of positive reinforcement. So positive reinforcement is where we'll add something at the end of a behavior. And what that addition will do is it will increase the behavior occurring in the future. And then negative reinforcement is first there's an aversive condition, the behavior happens, and then you remove that adversive condition. And so in the future, that behavior increases because the behavior removes the adversive condition. And again, the same thing with reinforcement. What is reinforcing to me may not be reinforcing to you and vice versa. So reinforcement is based on how it changes the behavior, not based on what it looks like. Stickers aren't always reinforcing. Candy is not always reinforcing. <laughs> Disneyland might not be reinforcing. Disneyland is not reinforcing for me. And there are people where a trip to Disneyland, they'll do so many things to earn a trip to Disneyland because it's so much fun and so reinforcing to them. Reinforcement is defined by its effect on behavior, not by what it is. Unconditioned reinforcement are the things that are naturally reinforcing to us. They don't require prior learning. These are biologically rooted survival-based rewards that are, that are effective across all individuals unless satiation occurs. So Though this is not perfect, a perfect way to think about this, I think it's the easiest way to think about this if you're answering questions or if, in your, if you're in the field and you're like, is this unconditioned or conditioned? Conditions are things that a baby would need. They need food, they need liquid, like breast milk or formula or something like that. And that's also their food. They need warmth. They need some, a little bit of comfort usually. And so if a baby desires it or it would be something that a baby needs it's probably unconditioned reinforcement now if it's something that a baby would not want it would be conditioned reinforcement such as an ipad a baby they haven't learned what an ipad is a lot of times even their like eyes ears all those their senses aren't ready to take in an ipad someone learns to like the ipad we aren't all immediately wanting ipads same with candy. A baby doesn't want candy off the bat. You can go through those things and figure out what's most likely to be unconditioned, what's likely to be conditioned. Food's really complicated because if you're hungry, all food's on condition. But if you're not hungry, so if it's a specific taste for something like cookies, then it would be considered conditioned. So that's how I think about this. And it's the easiest way to sort of process it, I find. So our unconditioned reinforcers are food, especially when hungry. So hunger triggers a powerful drive to seek and consume food, which is essential to being alive. Water, especially when thirsty. So thirst signals a need for water, which is crucial for hydration, organ function, and overall health. 
warmth. If you're too cold or too hot, getting the opposite is considered unconditioned. Sleep is unconditioned. Babies are born needing a lot of sleep. Sexual stimulation. Babies are not born needing that at all. But that is considered an unconditioned reinforcement. And to some degree, all living beings do desire that. Relief from pain. So any kind of pain relief is an unconditioned reinforcer. Air is unconditioned reinforcer. We all need access to air. Babies born needing that. Um, touch or physical con contact is an unconditioned reinforcer. Escape from adversive stimuli is considered an unconditioned reinforcer. So pain and escape from unconditioned from loud noises can also be considered unconditioned punishments if they're used as a punishment. So we both we have unconditioned punishers and conditioned punishers as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So conditioned reinforcement is everything else. So they, it was like a neutral stimuli that meant nothing to you or to the person. And at some time through learning or association, it became something that was a reinforcer. They liked it. They wanted it. It's still individualized to them, but they desired it. And they'll engage in behaviors to gain that. Same with unconditioned reinforcers, the most powerful we will engage in lots and lots of behaviors to gain those unconditioned reinforcers when we need them. And anytime you look at natural disasters or any time where people really are suffering, you can see that. Like they'll go through anything to get food. They'll go through anything to get water. It's a survival instinct. And again, this is important because this is therapy. We're not in a survival situation we don't want to use those. Those are not fair to use. Like everybody should be able to access those just naturally. And then what we're going to use are these conditioned reinforcers. And that's essentially part of the reason why I don't like using food very much because you don't always know the last time that child ate. And it might not even be, you know, a food where they don't have enough food in the home or something like mom made the mac and cheese for lunch. They didn't like it. And they said no. She was like, okay. An hour later, therapy starts, but now they're hungry. And you don't know that. Mom's not thinking that through maybe. Maybe she is super busy or, you know, left on the counter for them to grab themselves and they never did. Nobody's intentionally or even unintentionally hurting this child. It's just how the events of the day happen. And you start using food, that's just so unfair to that person. So that's why I don't like using food. Praise is verbal affirmation that is conditioned. Tokens, any kind of tokens, which we'll talk about more, are in token economies would be unconditioned. Money is unconditioned. We are not born needing money. Grades are conditioned. We're not born wanting that A+. Sticker stars are conditioned. We're not born needing those things. Certificates or awards are conditioned. Access to screen time, access to favorite toys or games, access approval or attention from peers or adults, points in a classroom behavior system, social attention, all the social media stuff. We are a baby's not born like wanting to be on Facebook and get likes or Instagram. Access to preferred activity and any kind of privileges, being able to pick music or sit in a special chair are all conditioned reinforcers. These are fair game to utilize for behavior change. I always say use those antecedent interventions first before we move into using differential reinforcement and using these. Because if you can do it without using these, then that's better. If you know they're engaging in problem behavior to get stickers, just give them access to stickers on contingently and see if that works before we move into a contingent intervention, which we'll talk about those contingent interventions. So unconditioned reinforcer needs no learning. It should be natural. Conditioned reinforcers require learning. Unconditioned is rooted in biology. Conditioned is not. Examples, food or water. Conditioned are praise and tokens. And then how susceptible are they to extinction? Unconditioned reinforcers are not very susceptible to extinction. There are situations where that does happen. So what that means is if you stop giving them, they engage in a behavior to get this. So if you stop giving them that reinforcer, does the behavior diminish? 
So if you think about it, if they engage in food, you know, if we're going hunter gather society or whatnot, and they're running, they're looking around the environment to gather fruit to eat. If they continue to look around the environment and they're not seeing as much fruit, that behavior will diminish. They'll start trying other things to get the food, but it takes a lot more time. Then when we look at the condition reinforcers, for example, if they're tantruming for an iPad, if you remove the iPad, they don't get an iPad for tantruming anymore. That behavior will be extinguished a lot faster because it's not something that they need for survival. So how pairing works, this is classical conditioning. So we have a neutral, well, actually, this is also how classical conditioning works but it's also how we get conditioned reinforcers. So you have a neutral stimuli with an existing reinforcer. This is all the food bell stuff with the dogs, Pavlov's dogs. So you have a bell and you have the food. The food is the unconditioned reinforcer. The bell is the conditioned reinforcer. When you put down the food, the dog has saliva, which is a reflex. And you ring bell, put down food, and they start having saliva for just the bell. So you made that into a, a conditioned stimuli. So reinforcers work really similar. So token plus access to preferred item. And we use this in teaching. So we're pairing. This is how we get our token economies to work is we pair those tokens with something that is actually a reinforcer. So like little stars on the star chart mean nothing. They might be, for some kids, they might be reinforcing just as is. I've seen kids light up for that. They don't even know what the stars mean, but they get excited about it. Let's say that's not the case. If you pair those stars with something that they actually want, you'll get conditioned reinforcers from just the stars. We compare these neutral stimuli that mean nothing with reinforcers. All the tokens are generalized condition reinforcers where it was completely neutral, meant nothing to the person, and it gets paired with something they actually like, and then it becomes a condition reinforcer. Reinforcers that have been paired with multiple backup reinforcers, making them effective across a wide range of situations. They're less susceptible to satiation than specific condition reinforcers. Examples, money is one, tokens, point system. Those are all generalized condition reinforcers. And token economies, classroom behavior plans, and work incentives. Okay, so real examples, giving a snack after a correct response in early intervention. Again, I don't like using food. Providing an unconditioned reinforcer like a snack to reinforce desired behavior in young children. Saying nice job paired with a thumbs up, using a condition reinforcer like praise paired with a physical gesture to reinforce a correct response, and using a token board to earn screen time, implementing a condition reinforcing system where tokens can be exchanged for preferred activities. You want to pair condition reinforcers with unconditioned ones when you're creating these generalized condition reinforcers at the beginning. You want to make sure you monitor for satiation. It, when it, anything overused is going to lose its value. If you give too much screen time, no one's going to want screen time. If you give too much attention, no one's going to want attention. So if you're constantly giving attention or the iPad and it's losing its value, you move to these generalized condition reinforcers. So they have to earn a couple stars to get that screen time. Reinforce immediately and, con and consistently is really key in this. So providing reinforcement right after desired behavior. That also, those tokens help that problem. So there's reinforcers that are impossible to provide in that moment, right? I've had students work really hard to do the morning announcements at a school. A lot of students really like that. If you're at a school, play with that one. Play with having lunch with the principal. All those things are really fun. You could give the morning announcements in the morning. Could there be another opportunity to do an announcement? Yes, if you can work that out, work that out. But if it is morning announcements and that's what we're going to do, what if they engage in the behavior in the middle of the day and they got to wait till the next morning? Instead, you want to put it on a token board so they earn tokens and they're getting something immediately, the tokens. And once they get the 10 tokens, then 
I even kind of plan this in a way where their last opportunity is right before morning announcements. So they get that last token and then you move right into the morning announcements that will make it more powerful. But you got it. There's lots of planning to this, but that's how you use those generalized condition reinforcers. One, if you're afraid of satiation of your reinforcer or two, they're t the time sensitive reinforcer. Like you can only do it a specific time. I had mine. I think I might have used this example, but my child got a hundred dolphin dollars. A hundred dolphin dollars got you a ride in the police car. That's a great, great reinforcer. He was really excited. He earned that and all that. But what happened was when he earned it, it was every two weeks they could offer this. He earned it right after they had offered it. So two weeks passed and he was uninterested at that point point he forgot to even ask about it that day so he never really received his reinforcers now if he had earned it right away he might have then gone back to earn more to do it again but after that he's not interested in that reinforcer anymore so he's not you know, saving up dolphin dollars for that and they get dolphin dollars for positive behavior in school so that's kind of like the problems that might happen with those Reinforcers that are naturally reinforcing without prior learning are your unconditioned reinforcers. Generalized condition reinforcers are the most versatile. Those are your token systems, money, any kind of thing that has no value and you tie it to something that does have value. Condition reinforcers are learned through pairing. So you pair it with existing reinforcers. Generalized condition reinforcers are learned through pairing. Understanding reinforcement types enhances your intervention design. So this should help you improve the effectiveness of your interventions.